I love you guys. Good, good morning. God bless you. Father God, please anoint this word. Anoint me as I speak. Speak through me. Less of me, more of you. Actually, none of me, all of you. Speak through me and have your way. And bless the hearts that receive with good soil so that they can produce a hundredfold return in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. So the title of my message is Christ Has Set Us Free. I figured that would be fitting for Independence Weekend. And I'm just going to go right into scripture about what Jesus said when he was in the temple in Luke 4, 18 and 19. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has, set, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Thank you, Jesus. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. When it says to preach the gospel to the poor, it means like the poor of spirit. Because without Jesus, you poor. And to heal the brokenhearted, thank you, Lord. And to proclaim liberty to the captives. That's what we're focusing on today. So John 18, verses 37 through 38, when uh, before Jesus was crucified, he was speaking to Pilate, and Pilate said, therefore, to him, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And of course, then Pilate says, well, what is truth? And in another place in the Bible, John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The goal for Jesus is always to get us to the Father, to reconcile us, to cause us to go from just simply being his creation to his child, and to have an intimacy with him. So he is the truth, praise God. And the truth makes us free, which I will read right now. You know me, I'm very heavy scripture, I love scripture. John 8, 31 through 36 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And we know that abide means to live, to, to have our constant dwelling in the word of God. <clears throat> and as you do that, then you are his disciples, and disciples are people that practice the teachings of their master, that being Jesus. And we will know the truth, who's Jesus, and the truth makes us free. Praise God. And it says here, a slave does not abide in the house forever. See, a son abides forever. And see, your sons and daughters, when you give your heart to Jesus, your sons and daughters, so you abide in the house forever. And the son of God makes you free. And then you shall be free indeed. I love to just dissect. Chew the cud and dissect. So in John 8, 36, Jesus makes a wonderful statement a victory. He says, so if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. These are powerful and encouraging words, and I want to issue you <clears throat> a big congratulations. For if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are free. However, have you ever taken the time to consider what you're freed from? In the Greek, this word free can mean to liberate or to exempt from liability. Because of this definition, when you consider this verse in its full context, 
There are two conclusions I want you to consider. First, there are things Christ has freed you from, liberated you. And second, there are things Christ has freed you to and exempted you from a liability. So cool. That's right. Freed you from. So let's, <laughs> so let's consider both sides of the coin because they are both critical to living the full and abundant life that Christ wants you to live, that he died for you to live. Hallelujah. So what has Christ the Son freed you from? Well, first and foremost, the bondage of sin. You were in captivity. For something or someone to be liberated, it must first have to be bound or imprisoned. The, first, the very definition of a captive is one who is confined. And that's exactly what we were before Christ. You and I were prisoners held under the bondage of sin. We were held captive by the impulses of sin. We were bound to the instincts of sin. We had no power to overcome the influence of sin. Sin was our ruler, and it held us captive. It's a truth. And in your days of living before Christ, whatever sin wanted to do, sin got what it wants. This doesn't necessarily mean you were out there living a wild, crazy lifestyle, though it could mean that. But it could simply mean that the primary authority in your life was your sinful nature. It was what was in control. In Romans, Paul, in Romans 6, Paul refers to sin as your master or your controller. So this scripture I'm going to read is talking to a born-again believer. Romans 6, 11 through 18. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not, li do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. You heard that? Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you've become a slave? You become a slave to whatever you choose to obey. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteousness or righteous living. Thank the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey his teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteousness, righteous living. I love the word. It's just awesome. There's so much richness in the word of God. When you were born again, something beautiful happened. God gave you a new nature and more importantly, filled you with his Holy Spirit. So now you are no longer under the control of your sinful nature. You've been set free. And Paul sums it up in 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. Isn't that a song? <laughs> Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed, thank you, Lord. We were blind, but now we see. Now we can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. And that's what I want. I want, for it, I want it for you. I want it for me. I want us to, the veil has been removed, and we need to reflect the glory of God in our lives. In the way we speak, in the way we act, in the way we think. How do we do it by the way we think? Well, the mind needs to be renewed by reading the word of God. That's the only way. Because, you see, when we're born again, our spirit is born again. But our flesh, or our body, our carnal nature, and our mind need renewing. Otherwise, if, you're, if your mind and your body are still carnal, 
then they are going to overpower the spirit and they're going to have their way. And then that's what causes us to become carnal Christians. So you have to make the majority in your life the mind and the spirit. And then you can put that flesh under and say, no, I don't care what you want, body. The spirit and the mind, <clears throat> we're the majority here, and we're telling you what to do. No, you can't have more than one chocolate kiss, Jessica. <laughs> one. My weakness lately has been, and now I'm sounding like my husband, <laughs> but my, we my weakness lately has been these dark chocolate caramels with salt on top. I have like two a day, like pills. Every day, I make sure I have like my two chocolate. <laughs> But they're so good. It's just the consistency. It's the, the, the caramel. It's the chocolate. It's the salt. It's that sweet and savory. Oh, baby. But I have to keep my flesh under. So right now, it's no more than two a day. So just like when the veil is torn. Okay, so the veil was torn in the temple. And when people think the veil was torn in the temple, they're thinking this very thin veil. No, it was a really thick curtain. And it was really high. So when Jesus died... That veil was ripped, and not from the bottom up. It was ripped from the top down. It was ripped, and it was thick curtain. I don't know why they called it a veil. It was a thick curtain. And that tells me that it's not a veil that blinds us. It's a thick curtain that blinds us before we give our lives to Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for removing the blinders. So just like when the veil was torn in the temple, when Jesus died, giving us direct access to the Father. See, that's what it was. When he said, it is finished, and he died, and that veil was torn, that gave us access into the Holy of Holies. That gave us free access to the Father, and that's all Jesus ever wanted for us, was to give us free access to the Father. So we can be children again of the King, daughters and sons of the King. That's all he ever wanted. He wanted to restore us back. To what the devil stole. So we absolutely have access to the Holy Spirit when we become believers in Jesus Christ and we get the opportunity to enjoy the full freedom of intimate and close relationship with God or the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That mystery, three in one, but one God, three in one. Three. My husband would say three distinct personalities. I'm not sure. I think it's definitely a mystery until we get there to heaven, but Father, Son, Holy Spirit, hallelujah. And the whole, and G, when Jesus ascended 40 days after he rose from the dead, I love to point that out, he did not rise from the dead immediately. He was on the earth for 40 days. Then he ascended, but he said, guys, go to Jerusalem and wait because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, your comforter. So thank the Lord Jesus that he left us with the Holy Spirit or else where would we be? So Christ has freed you from the penalty of sin. First it was the bondage, now it's the penalty of sin. For Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, the wages of sin is death, eternal death. I'll say that saying again. If you are born once, you die twice. If you are born twice, you die once. So if you're born just through your mother's womb and you die without Christ, you will die physically and then die spiritually separated from God in hell. But if you're born twice or you're born through your mom's womb and then you're born again or born from above by submitting your life to Christ, then you die only once. You just leave this body and go straight, zoom, to heaven. And um, I look forward to that day. I know, I, but, but I'm needed here, so I have a job to do. So I will do my job until it's finished. So let's be very frank here. Outside of Christ, we all had an eternal death sentence. That's right. <laughs> you and I were on death row. We were. You may not have understood it and probably didn't even grasp the gravity of it, but that's where we were without Christ. Unfortunately today, though, too many people still don't understand that. Because of our sin, you and I were on a path to be eternally separated from the very presence of God. This is the eternal penalty or liability of our sin, being born into sin. 
But thankfully, the story doesn't end there. Paul stated, states here that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. See, when the Father looks at you now, he doesn't just see me. He actually sees me through Christ. Christ is before me, so he sees me, and he sees me beautiful. He sees me perfect. He sees me clean. And that's the way he sees you when you're in Christ. He sees Christ first, so he has to go through Christ before he could see you. And by the time he gets through Christ, you're white as snow. I love that. So when Jesus sets you free, he takes away your death sentence. The penalty you deserved has been removed, and now you have eternal life. He literally shifted your eternal destiny. So today you can rejoice because if you have Christ, then you have eternal life. You no longer have to pay the penalty for your sin. For in John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. See, it's kind of like you're in court, and you know you're guilty. They've got all the evidence stacked against you. So you're standing before the judge. All the evidence is stacked against you. You know you're guilty. Everyone knows you're guilty. You deserve the penalty. And in comes Jesus, the spotless lamb of God. And he says to the father who's the judge, I'm taking her place. And he moves me out of the way, and he says, I'm taking the place of Jessica. And then he took my sin on him, and he took my penalty, and he died, and he went to hell for me so that I will never have to do that. So as long as I put my faith, when it says believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved, believe means to cling to, rely on, and trust. Just the way we cling to our loved ones. We cling who, to who we love. And so Jesus wants us to cling to him. And as we cling to him, we are saved. As we trust and rely on him for everything. Hallelujah. So Christ has also freed us from the guilt and shame of sin. Have you ever experienced the feeling of guilt? Yeah. Have you ever felt shame for things you've done in your past? Have you ever repented but felt like, you needed to repent again because you felt so bad by what you did that you really want to make sure God really forgave you. Just sometimes we just can't shake certain things. And whereas God's forgiven us, we're, we, we have a hard time. And we've all done things that we're ashamed of, things that we wish we could take back and never do again. And we all have the capacity to relive our bad moments, questioning why did we do that? However, when you do this, all you're doing is creating more guilt and shame. This can haunt you and it can cripple you, taking away your capacity to live and develop, which is your vitality. But the good news, the good news, is that you have all been set free in Christ. When you sincerely repent, when you have sincerely repented, God forgave you. He removed that sin from you as far as the east is from the west. And you know that the east and the west never meet. And he doesn't remember it anymore. He throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. He will never bring it up again, and neither should you. It's under the blood. That blood wasn't shed for no reason. And that blood is so precious and so powerful. So 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins to the Father, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See? So all we have to do is confess it, confess it. And then he's the one who's faithful and just to not only forgive us, but to cleanse us. I'm talking better than bleach, cleanses you where it's gone, no more. And Psalm 103, 12 says, he has removed our sins as far from us as the east, east. <laughs> the east is from the west. He's such a good God, so good. So when you understand what Christ has freed you from, it sets the stage for you to live in what Christ has freed you to. So what has Christ freed you to? He freed you to truly live. 
one of the reasons it's so important to understand that you are free from the bondage, penalty, and guilt of sin is because now it increases your capacity through Jesus to love, to have joy, to experience peace that passes all understanding, and to enjoy life. Now, I'm not saying that life here on earth is easy, okay? Because that's definitely not the truth. You know, we all go through things. We all experience horrible things because, you know, thank you, Adam and Eve, but they gave, you know, dominion over this earth to Satan, little s, the adversary. And, you know, yes, so we are going to have trials and tribulations. Jesus never said we weren't, but he, would, he said he would be with us through them all. And he does increase your capacity to have a better and full life despite what we have to go through here on this earth. Because not only that, as I've covered before, he gives you the authority to whoop the enemy's butt because he redeemed you and restored you back to what you're supposed to be. And we are supposed to exercise it and activate it and walk in it. He also wants to increase your capacity to have a relationship with your Heavenly Father. Like I've said before, it's all about Jesus wanting to bring you to the Father. This can't happen, though, if you're not free. You cannot live a vibrant, living, loving relationship with God or with anyone else for that matter if you are holding on to the guilt and shame of your past. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, in the New King James Version, I'm actually going to read it in both versions, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. See, Satan hates you. You are made in God's image. He hates you. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. And he wants to take as many down to hell with him as possible. And if he can't take you, then he will try to mess with you. So once you learn your, your authority in Christ, you can fight back. Because to be totally honest, there are days when I feel like I have more grief than normal. And then I have to remind myself, there's low-level familiar spirits that love to mess with us. And I'm realizing, okay, you know, sometimes we forget. We're like, duh. Duh. So then I say, all right, I come against you, spirit of grief, sadness, depression. I come against you in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is against you. Get off me. Get out. And then I draw a bloodline of the blood of Jesus around up my house. And I say, you can't cross the bloodline. And you've got to constantly do that. It's a fight of faith. This is not something that's going to end until we leave this body. So you fight the devil with the authority that Christ gave you. And it's only in Christ that you have this authority. So John 10, 10 in the Passion Translation says, a thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Amen. Amen. Jesus is always about bringing us to the Father and giving us fullness of life. He didn't shed that blood for nothing. So James 4, 8 in the Passion Translation says, Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer to you. Now, that's all I was going to read, but then I read the rest and I went, hmm, but make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners. And keep your heart pure and stop doubting. See, like I said, Jesus is always trying to bring us closer and closer to the Father. But we do have to cleanse our lives. And, and notice he's saying, you cleanse your life. Now, it's not that we have the power, but he's just saying, confess your sins so he's faithful and just to forgive you for your sins. Take the steps to cleanse your life and walk in it. And whenever you trip and fall in sin, you dust yourself off and you say, Father, forgive me. Help me to walk before you. I always say, help my thoughts, my, my words, and my actions be pleasing to you, Father. 
So cleanse your life and keep your heart pure by renewing your mind with the word of God. I love that because I said cleanse your life and I wrote Jesus equals soap. Right? He's our soap. And stop doubting. And how do we stop doubting? We, we build up our faith by reading the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you want to combat doubt? Increase your faith by increasing your word. Read your word every day. Don't be spiritually emaciated, okay? Because the, the familiar spirits, they know. They know. They watch you. They know how weak you are or they'll know how strong you are. So now Christ gave you the freedom to serve. He freed you to serve and fulfill your God-given destiny. Because I know not everyone likes the word serve. But, you know, we have to be servants of the Lord God Almighty. Ephesians 2.10 in the Passion Translation says, I love this. This is so beautiful. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works or the good things that we would do to fulfill it. Is that absolutely a magnificent scripture? Like I said in Psalm 139, 16, and you should just read one, well, Psalm 139. It's just beautiful. He wrote a book about you before he, you were born. He wrote a book about you. He wrote a book about all the days of your life, your destiny. And yes, with our free will, we can go off track and not fulfill those books. But let's strive to walk with the Lord and fulfill our destiny in the books that were written about us. I mean, I love that. Before we were even born, he planned in advance our destiny. Oh, and the good things or the good works that we would do to fulfill it. I want to fulfill my destiny. And I declare that each and every one of you shall fulfill your God-given destiny. And the books written about you before he breathed you into your mother's womb. So one of the reasons Christ has freed you is because he has work for you to do. <laughs> he has a plan for your life. Remember, you are saved by grace. You live by grace. God will accomplish his plan in your life by grace. Christ freed, frees you so that your activity doesn't flow out of some sense of trying to win God's approval. Your approval doesn't come because of what you do but because of what Christ has already done. When you understand this, you are free to accomplish the plan God has for your life with no agenda, no ulterior motive, but out of a heart motivated by love for him. And that's what it all comes down to. There's no salvation by works. It's a gift. Everything we do for Jesus is motivated out of a heart of love for Jesus. And everything we do is by grace. The very fact that we are here today in New Covenant Church is by the grace of God. Like Tom said months or weeks ago, I will not forget that because he's right. When people asked, you know, you still got church? Well, why? Just because Pastor Rob went to heaven, we got we to close shop? No. He got promoted, we got promoted. Now we have to, you know, we can't abandon ship. We can't leave our post as long as we have breath in us, as long as we have strength, we have to move forward. And because it's not just about my husband. It's, it's, it's definitely not about my husband. He started it. We're finishing it. He passed the baton. This is for Jesus. We are doing the work of the Lord. We are moving forward in the will of God to fulfill his plans, purposes, and pursuits in the earth. In Jesus' name, right? So God is good all the time. God is good. <laughs> In the dictionary, freedom is defined as the power or right to act, speak, or think without hindrance or restraint. And that completely wraps up everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. There is only one thing left for you to do. And Galatians 5.1 says it. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. 
Now there's another another um, translation, and I couldn't find it, but I love the way it said it. It said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I love that, so po po poetic. And so um, I want to read Galatians 5, 13 and 14. 5, 14. The Passion Translation. Beloved ones, see? He loves you. Beloved ones, God has called us to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit. But don't view this wonderful freedom as an opportunity to set up a base of operations in the natural realm. Don't you love that? Carnal nature. Freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another, expressing love in all we do. For love completes the laws of God. All of the law can be summarized in one grand statement. Demonstrate love to your neighbor even as you care for and love yourself. And that is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And think about it. You know, the do unto others as you have them do unto you. If we really did love our neighbors as ourselves, we would not be doing nasty things to each other because we wouldn't want nasty things done to us. And that covers the law. That covers everything. As long as you follow that, you will not break the law of, of, of God to, to live in freedom and live in the Holy Spirit. So to end, I'd like to read Galatians 5 again, 5.1 in the Passion Translation. Let me be clear. The Anointed One has set us free, not partially, but completely and wonderfully free. We must always cherish this truth and stubbornly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. The past does not exist anymore. Those people are dead. We are dead. And now we are alive to God. Dead to sin, alive to God. And if we were baptized, that's just, um, as my I love my husband's words. Baptism is an outward work, an outward um, uh, thank you. An outward expression of an inward work. So if you gave your life to Jesus and then you get baptized, when you go under the water, you die. You go under the water and you die. And then, then it's no longer you that comes up, but you in Christ Jesus comes up out of that water to new life. So good. So enjoy your freedom. Live the life Christ has freed you to live in him. For in him you live and move and have your being. I love that song. Ah, that's a song I used to sing in my old church in the Bronx. God is good. So if you don't have freedom, I encourage you to give your life to Jesus. Submit, surrender yourself completely to him. And like Tom said earlier, it's not a, it's not a big, grand, specific type of prayer. All you do is say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I make you my Lord. I like to say I take myself off the throne and I put you on the throne of my life. Do, do with me what you will. So I encourage you. If you haven't done that, get alone with God and give your heart to Jesus. And otherwise, everyone here is free indeed in Jesus' name. Father God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for each and every individual here. I ask that you bless them. Oh, yes, yes, I'm going to say the scripture. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen.